the Financial Survival Network, helping you survive and thrive in the new economy. Go to carrylutz.com and sign up for 30 free micro trainings on financial survival. 1490 WGCH, this is Carrie Lutz, and you're listening to the Financial Survival Network which is brought to you by Miles Franklin. They've been in business selling gold and silver for over 20 years. And I'm a customer because when you buy, they ship. For more information, find them on the web at milesfranklin.com or give them a call at 800-822-8080 and get a free quote. Obamacare seems to have been all but forgotten during this crazy campaign season. But the fact is, the case is up in the Supreme Court. It's waiting for a decision. Decisions coming down in July, it might get upheld. You never know, because whenever a case goes to the Supreme Court, anything can happen. So I've got somebody here, Richard S. Bernstein. He's an expert in insurance and health insurance. He's been an advisor to Donald Trump. He's been studying the insurance industry for years, and he's here now to help shed some light on this situation. Hey, Richard, welcome to the Financial Survival Network. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be to be a guest. And we're really happy to have you because it's not something we've talked about much. Uh, we have a presumption here at the Financial Survival Network, and that's that all government laws, programs, anything they do is just going to make the situation worse until the eventual collapse occurs. So we just haven't been focusing on it, but I thought it was a good time now to talk to somebody who really understood the magnitude of it and bring us up to date on what we can look forward to with yet another congressional monstrosity. Well, it's very scary. I mean, there's some, you know, every bill has some good parts and some bad parts. So maybe I should talk about the good parts of the bill first, and then I go into the things that I think that, that, that could be a problem for America and the employees of this country. Uh, the good parts of the bill is that it, you have an unlimited amount of money for the health care. There's no limitation of a million dollars. So that if you have a sickness that can be cured, but it's, it's expensive because you're using the latest drugs or the latest equipment or the hospital, there's enough money to, to make sure that you survive. Number two, uh, pre-existing conditions. It covers pre-existing conditions, so you're covered there. And the third thing is if you have children that are under 26 that are still in college or out getting their first job or can't get a job, they're covered up to age 26. That's the three good parts of the bill. After that, it's a problem. Uh, in 2014, when all of the employers in the United States decide to, to pay uh, the fine instead of paying for the health care, and the employees in this country get hit with a bill from between 500 a month to 2,500 a month, depending upon uh, you, if you have dependents or if you're married or if you're single. And that could easily happen because if one employer pulls the plug, the second employer is going to pull the plug. So you won't be able to go to another employer to get health care if they decide to pull the plug. And the other thing is that, that, that I think the government is happy that they're going to pull the plug because it's deductible right now. All the health care that the employers pay it's deductible. It comes off the top of their, their bill. And when you start paying it or we start paying it, meaning the employees, it won't be deductible because you won't meet the, the standard for deductibility. And I think that that's going to be a, a serious problem in this country. And then, the, then you have the government that's in charge. And the question that I ask everybody listening to this, anybody who's in a state where they allow gambling, Everybody knows that in the beginning when they allowed the gambling, it was supposed to all go towards education. And my question to everybody is, where is the money going now? I mean, it's not. How much, of it's, it's not how much going is going to edu <laughs> education and how much is, is, is going towards, you know, the budget? And what's going to stop the government 10 years from today? You have no, new senators, new congressmen, new, new advisors, and all of a sudden, the government says, well, we got all this money that we're supposed to get from Obama bill to cover health care, but we needed to, to balance our budget or we needed to do certain things inside the budget. What guarantee that the government doesn't make some changes or make some amendments or does whatever it has to do to control that money? 
And this is the biggest industry in the country right now. It's growing at 30% a year. It is a tremendous industry. And the thing that sets off this country from any other country in the world is our health care program, besides the ability to come here and get a job and make money and, and not have it, the problems. Now you have the government telling us what is, what's going to be covered, what's not going to be covered, you know, and who knows what they're going to tell us. Who knows what? If you're 65 and older, if you have certain medications that you need for cancer or that you need for other kind of medication, who knows if you're 45 to 55 and you have a, an arm injury or, or a knee injury that they don't put you on a six-month waiting period like the rest of the world. Who knows what they're going to do on MRIs? Who knows what the government's going to do? Maybe they run out of money in the first half of the fiscal year and they don't have money in the second half. The point is that we don't want to be controlled by the federal government on our health care. And that's what this bill is going to do. It is going to have the government tell America what they can and can't do. And right now, people are blaming the insurance industry. And I can understand why they're doing that. But let's look at both sides of the coin. Number one, you have a lot of fraud going on in this, in this country. You have a lot of frivolous lawsuits. Those two pieces alone would be about a 35% reduction in the cost of health care if we were to step in and fix those two pieces alone. And that's a big number. So now you have that going on. And now you have the insurance companies and everybody's blaming them whether they're not paying for this medication, they're not paying for this. Well, with all the fraud going on, they're checking out the medication. I don't know about the rest of the people in this country. I only can tell you about my practice in what we do with our customers. When we have a client or an employee of a company that has trouble getting claims paid, that's what we do. We step up to the plate and help our customers get the claims paid and get the medication that they need in order to take care of themselves. And that's what we're supposed to do. And that's what the insurance companies are supposed to do. And that's what the agents who represent you are supposed to do. On the other hand, you have insurance companies, you have drug companies, and you have hospitals at this sector taking money, building reserves because they don't know what the Obama bill is going to bring to forth. They don't know what the cost is going to be. And they're scared to death because they don't know where the money is going to come from to pay for these. That's and, another problem. And, and here's the thing. We talk about fraud. We talk about frivolous lawsuits. How many tests get done because the doctor's just trying to cover his backside and make himself or herself insurance proof, litigation proof. So you wind up getting subjected to a battery of tests, many of which you don't need, but there's a one in one million chance that you just might have that particular ailment. So the doctor just checks off the form or clicks the mouse and you wind up getting over tested. How much of the medical care is just defensive medicine aimed at protecting the doctor's livelihood reputation from frivolous uh, lawsuits. There's a lot of that going on. And also, what you see is the hospitals doing that a great deal now, and the, and the hospitals are trying to control the doctors. The next step is that, the, is that 10 or 15 years from there, you might not have independent doctors. Yep. They might not be, a, be able to afford to be in practice. And the problem is that the hospitals are controlling them. So it's going to be my doctor, and it won't, you won't have an independent. And, and, the, and, and the hospitals are running those same tests, too. I can only tell you that the last year and a half of my mother's life, the bills were astronomical. And I know that, that she was on the Medicare. I know that that number would have been a lot less if she would have been allowed to go to her primary care and take care of her. But because she was at a, in a, lived in a di different district, and where the doctor, where her primary care doctor was, they put a new doctor in charge. And the new doctor would run the same kind of test all over again to protect himself and protect the hospital. And it was very, very expensive. And those are the kind of things that, that, that we're not talking about. What they're talking about is the 30% of the people that are not covered that are entitled to be covered. And if the government took care of the frivolous lawsuits and took care of the fraud, those 30% would be covered. And the other thing that the government's not talking about, which is very scary to me, 
is a, my opinion. This is just an opinion of mine now. I believe that all government employees, including federal, state, county, city, local municipalities, should all be under the VA system. If it's good enough for the boys and girls in Iraq and Iran, it would be good enough for them. And the government, in turn, could take any doctor that wants to be become a doctor and work for the government and give them their education and let them work for them for six to eight years. They could buy up every empty hospital bed in America and pay for it. That would be important. And that, that would and that would get rid of these empty beds. They put money back into the system. They could take these doctors who can't afford their malpractice insurance and they could hire them for a day or two every week or three, whatever it would take. And they could go to work and they would have doctors that are that are very good can do their job, and, and it would help put money back into the system because by the government buying up the beds and by everybody putting the money up and taking the, the 30 per, and the other big thing that no one's talking about is the illegals. You got $21 million, and if they were to put up $200 per, per family per month, a minimum, times $21 million times 12, you'd have a tremendous cash flow coming into, in, into the system. And you wouldn't have the problems that we have in healthcare, hey, and the government wouldn't be coming after the private enterprise. And there's another thing. I happen to live in the People's Republic of New York State, so a number of years ago, I wanted to get a catastrophic health insurance policy, meaning I would pay up to X amount for all the doctors, everything, and and then I'd pay a fraction of what the full service insurance plan cost me. And once I had that, then I would effectively self-insure for the first $10,000. And I would save way more than that. And the insurance company would be there just for a disaster, for major illness or for uh, accident, major accident, something like that, hospital care. And you know what New York State said to me, Richard? They said, you can't have that policy. It's not fair. You have to have the same policy that everyone else has, you know, with minor variations, with all the options. So it's like you go to the car dealership to buy a car, and the dealer says, sorry, you have to take every option here, and you have to pay 15 or 20% more than the stripped-down car that, by the way, we advertised in the paper, but we don't have any more of them. So this is what you get whether you want it or not. How do we address the state regulatory scheme that often winds up uh, costing us and giving us benefits that we don't want? I, I think I have a simple answer for that. And the simple answer is, and, and I, I think Trump even advocates this, is that you should be able to cross state lines on a health care policy. My thinking is that you should be able to buy a policy it covers you in every, in any state in America. If you want extras on it, like you're talking about, if they want to put extra, then each state can put on whatever they want to put on and charge extra to have those extra benefits. But you should be able to buy a policy like an HSA policy or the $10,000 deductible. It covers X. And every state should have the same thing. So that if you lived in New York or you lived in Utah or you lived in Florida or Texas, it would it wouldn't make a difference. You'd be covered. But what I the one thing I do like that we should talk about is it's better to have the insurance commissioners of fifty states monitoring you than it is to have one. Like example, with what happened with Bernie Madoff in the in, in, in the investment field. I like the states' regulations. I like the states that that that, that keep control. But there's no reason why we couldn't have one policy, just like the life insurance industry has, and you pay extra for certain things. There's no reason why we couldn't have one policy that would cover everybody in every state, and that would make things very simple and easy. Yeah, and yeah, I agree with you. I'd much rather see insurance regulated on a state-by-state -state basis, but what's happened with insurance commissions around the country especially in the more strongly regulatory states like New York, I guess California, Massachusetts, Illinois, is that they've used these requirements to keep out competition. So as a result, you only have a few insurers in each bracket, a few major ones, 
They have to meet various requirements, licensing, and a lot of companies say, you know what, we can't make enough money there. We don't want to bother. So it's a real problem with the state regulatory scheme. And then you've got an emerging federal regulatory scheme. And what the net effect is, is it reduces competition, right? Yes, and they shouldn't do that. They should mandate that you that you have so many insurance companies that are in business and not just the Blues, United, Aetna, and the other ones. They should mandate that 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 you that you, that to have more coverage and to have more companies in business because when you do, it drives the cost down, not up. And the problem is if the government steps in and is the only the only game in town, you and I both know it's like the post office. The price is going to go up, not down. And, and that's the problem. And the quality and is going to go down for sure. There's no doubt about the quality. The quality of service will go down. And it's scary because, because what we're doing now is we're learning more about new drugs, new procedures, and people are living longer. The other thing is that I think that, that our country should have a most favorable clause in the contract that if these drug companies sell the drugs over to Cuba or to Canada or to China cheaper than, than, than we buy, we should get the same price. And that would be, bet, that would be good for, America, for, the, for the citizens of this country because our cost of drugs are higher than anybody else's. And it shouldn't be. That's the other problem. That's a very serious problem. Well, we get into the whole FDA licensing scheme and how that winds up keeping out potentially beneficial medications and effectively making it so that only the largest, most well-capitalized pharmaceutical companies can get medications approved by some pointy-headed bureaucrats, some of whom actually have scientific degrees. Well, that's very scary, as you and I know, because this country wasn't built on, on, on big businesses. That's why they came up with the word monopoly. <laughs> that's why they did certain things in this country in the past that wouldn't let it happen. And for some reason, we're not working on that. We're not doing what's best for the public, and the public doesn't understand it. And the FDIC, is, I think they're out of control myself, but that's another story. I mean, I'm not here to judge them. I'm only here to look at, at what's happening. And you look at the health care, and you look at the cost of drugs. I know when my mother was alive, she was buying her drugs from Canada. And they were 60% of the cost that you can buy in this country. I mean, it's ridiculous. It shouldn't be that way. My in-laws uh, live in Texas, and every month or two, they take a little trip south of the border, and you see it. You go to Tijuana, you go to Juarez, you go to El Paso, all these places to the border, I should say, to Laredo, Laredo whatever's on the other side there. And the first thing you're confronted with when you cross that border, Richard, is 85 gazillion pharmacies who are selling the same stuff with maybe a little different wrapper for a fraction of the cost. Oh, and while you're there, go fill up your, uh, your car with some subsidized gasoline that's also a fraction of the cost. And, you know, what we're being called upon to do as Americans is unfairly subsidize development of drugs and enrich the pharmaceutical companies, who I'm not an enemy of by any stretch. I just don't like to see them get government benefits bestowed upon them. I don't like governments picking the winners and the losers, which when we both talk about the Obamacare, that's what Obamacare is all about, isn't it? Winners and losers sponsored by the U.S. government, right? Yeah, and it shouldn't be. It, it should, I mean, I think about it when I came into the insurance business, you could go into a semi-private room. Actually, I've been in business, I was in business for 10 years. You can go into a semi, semi-private room in our hospital in Florida for $22 a day. Wow. And that, but, but, you know, but, but you didn't have the government in your business at that time. And the doctors allowed allow them to come in, which is a mistake. The government is in full, full you know, full forge and, and ahead now, and it's very expensive. Yeah, I mean, it is very, very expensive, and they have to figure out a way to cut this, cut the fraud down, and they cut these frivolous lawsuits out and do what's appropriate. 
Yeah, they but, have to send it to the plate and do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, no one, make, <laughs> no one wants to do that. No politician. It might cost them uh, votes in the next election. And yeah, well, that's the problem because when our when our country was was created, they weren't supposed to be lifetime politicians. They were supposed to be wealthy people who came out of the community and went to Washington and did their job and then put someone else in place and went home and didn't make it a career. And the problem is now we're fighting with career politicians instead of figuring out what's best for for our country. They're more concerned about getting elected and reelected and, and not taking the right stance for what's best for you and I. And that's a serious problem in this country. Uh, you totally nailed it. And everything the government touches, they intervene in, it becomes the quality goes down, affordability goes down as well. Look at college education. When my sister... Um, I don't want to tell her age because she'll get angry at me, but suffice it to say, she went to uh, Douglas College in New Jersey in the mid-60s, and her tuition, I think, was $200 a month. And when my father took her to, to school, uh, driving down, he like lit up a $20 bill and threw it out the window, and she said, what are you doing? And he said, every time you cut a class, you know, or you don't pass one, it costs... Twenty dollars. You're just taking it and tossing it out the window, and now you know it'd be fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a semester. Forget it. Whatever the state school is going for in Jersey now, New York's around thirteen thousand a year. But that's what we're looking at: government intervention, easy money, and protection. Not allowing other colleges to get licensed. We have uh, anti-competitive market, and we have high prices poor quality of service. And on that note, Richard, we've got to get moving. Just uh, if people want to learn more about you, about your consulting, about getting insurance companies to pay, where can they find you? Well, uh, first of all, I have an 800 number, 1-800-676-6601. And it's rsb at rbernstein.com. They can call me. They can look at my website. And uh, I'll be happy to help them in any way, give them any information that they want to have. It'll be right. my pleasure. Hey, well, it's been a pleasure having you on, Richard. We'll definitely be talking to you again. Uh, we'll definitely make a note in the calendar to talk to you once the Obamacare decision has been handed down. Because one way or the other, we need to do a post-mortem on it so that people really understand if it stands, where do you stand? And if it's struck down... We're going to have chaos, and people are going to need to know from you more than ever if it's struck down. Because if it's struck down, that means a lot of the things that have been put in place no longer apply, and we're going to need to know what what do we do, right? I appreciate that. I, you're exactly correct. It, it's very scary. So It is really scary as to what we're going to do and what we should do and where we're going. And, and people, you know, the biggest problem that I find out is that most of the people you talk to, they say the bill is so overwhelming. I don't understand it. And the point is, it's not reading the entire 2,900 pages or 2,700 pages. It's understanding the basics of that bill and understanding why it's not in their best interest and what they need to do to protect themselves and their family. Right. That's what's important. Absolutely. So rbernstein.com, B-E-R-N-S-T-E-I-N.com, right? Yeah, it's RSB at rbernstein.com. All right, we got it. Hey, thanks again. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You have a wonderful day.